Welcome to Chiropractic Conversations. I'm Dr. Brian McCauley, president of Parker University, and we are very excited today. We have an icon with us, a chiropractic icon, Dr. Lou Sportelli. Um, you probably know his bio pretty well, but uh, uh, you should know that he was the president of the World Federation of Chiropractic. He held several leadership positions at the ACA, including president and, of course, many years as a senior executive of NCMIC, our our malpractice carrier, and is uh, many consider him to be the the father of chiropractic, uh, the father of chiropractic in a way. Uh, his his patient centered book on chiropractic has sold in the millions, three to four millions, in its forty years of publishing through fourteen editions, and he continues to lead our profession and to and to advocate. And he's on campus today speaking to our students. So a big day for us here on campus. Dr. Sportelli, welcome. We're glad you're here. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. I was wondering if I could kind of talk about past, present, and future a little bit and, and have you think, if you would, about a key event in chiropractic in history that has really helped shape where we are and how far we've come. Well, I think the key event, we have to look at it in retrospect. When it was happening, we didn't know about it, which was the conspiracy of the AMA. I, I, I think who knew back in 1963 that a committee to contain and eliminate our profession was formed by the American Medical Association? While that was done and in the clever way that the AMA um, decided to uh, have the invisible hand of the AMA never show, uh, they successfully launched a, a campaign um, that we are still suffering from today, the, 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 the repercussions of that campaign in terms of what it did to form – uh, public opinion and what it did to deprive the profession of opportunities and cultural authority, we're still suffering from that today. So I, if I were to give one single thing that probably shaped um, the direction of the profession positively and negatively was the AMA Committee on Quackery in 1963. Was it a, um, was it a joint kind of decision or was there one primary person in the AMA that that really made that happen? Oh, there's no question. There, there, there was a, a number of folks. Uh, Doyle Taylor uh, and uh, was the uh, executive director and, and uh, uh, the, the gentleman that ran the AMA for years and years and years, the medical Mussolini, um, essentially for 20 years ran the AMA up with an iron fist and made the AMA into the powerhouse that it is today. You're talking about Morris Fishbein. Morris Fishbein. Um, so bottom line is that, that – I believe that they were looking um, uh, to to find uh, a mechanism, uh, and and these folks got together and clandestinely formed this committee on quackery. And um, you know, we know a little bit about the history, and this played out. How was this discovered? How did it come to light? Well, it 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 came to light obviously when uh, when Chester Wilk and and four other plaintiffs uh, filed a lawsuit and. And we were indeed fortunate that that the galaxies were aligned, and we were able to to obtain um, George McAndrews as our counsel, who not only was a an incredibly brilliant attorney, but also had family roots in chiropractic. And basically, uh, in the end, George did this for Dad. Um, the the things that his father endured, as many chiropractors did in the early days. Um, George just wanted to make sure that he did some restitution for his father. So during discovery, of which there were over a million documents, uh, uncovered some of the most um, abs- uh, Im- I- impossible to comprehend documents of how far they went to essentially discredit the profession. Um, here we are in an, in an educational institution. <clears throat> On one hand, their, their cry was chiropractors were uneducated, essentially basically stupid practitioners, didn't know anything. On the other hand, they did everything they can do to prevent anybody with a degree, an MD degree, a PhD degree, from teaching in a chiropractic institution. So you can't have it both ways. You can't call us stupid and then prevent us from becoming educated. So that was sort of the things that most people didn't quite understand, is the depth to which they went to to, uh, prevent chiropractic from gaining any kind of acceptance or credibility. So that was the educational piece. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from, the, from the marketing piece, of course, 
Um, the AMA uh, said they didn't want to uh, be discovered in, in terms of any of their activities. So what they did was they went to the American Cancer Society, American Arthritis Association, and whatever other American association we had. They wrote their position paper on chiropractic as a ghostwriter. And then they'd come out to the press and say, look, we're not the only ones who think this. All of these American groups feel the same way. Here's their position paper. So they did a very clever job, even to the point of, of getting Ann Landers to, to write a column uh, uh, about chiropractic, which was later exposed and to her, um, uh, to her uh, I think, regret for the rest of her career um, that she actually got caught up in this thing. Yeah. So they did it on a public relations basis. They did it on an educational basis, and then they did it on a legislative basis. For example, um, the documents showed that the Health and Human Services, HEW, that the AMA actually fixed a report that was going to come out of HEW. The report was written before the hearing was ever started. So <laughs> when you think about, they looked at the, the profession to figure out how we're going to attack this, did it like a war, a war plan, figured they attacked the profession on every single angle. And it is absolutely amazing today, Brian, that we as a profession are existing and flourishing despite the enormity of the obstacles that, that the profession was uh, faced with. And we didn't know it up until then. Wow. So education, marketing, and the legislative side. And uh, it, this was obviously before emails and texts. So was this done through committee minutes or was this uh, – how, how, what were the documents? What was the nature well, of the documents? Well, w was fortunately, uh, we didn't have email. And fortunately – so um, the AMA had to essentially write this on paper. So – um, and here's an interesting little thing that ultimately came back to bite them. Um, when um, the documents, uh, when the f discovery was first done, the documents, as you know, have to be preserved by law. So the AMA uh, said that they had all the documents and a janitor mistook them for trash and, and got rid <laughs> of them all. So uh, what George McAndrews did, took depositions, hundreds of them all over this country, and in the files of the, uh, of the medical societies across the country, he found data in their files that the AMA claimed they didn't have because they had to write these. They put them in a file, and, of course, ultimately, to our advantage, those documents were discovered wow. and, and ultimately became the very curse that the AMA did, never wanted to show. So there was a chain through – through knowledge and distribution through societies. Absolutely. It was impossible to keep this It was impossible. Well, once you, you know, the only way to keep a secret is to have only one person. When right. you got two people, you can't keep a secret yeah. anymore. So what they did was they spread this out across the country. But, but what they had going for them, uh, remember, we're dealing way back, when people actually believed that the government was not corrupt, that the AMA was a, a really a force for good, um, it was hard for people to get their arms around the fact that this organization that they so revered would ever, ever engage in this kind of clandestine activity. It was hard to convince anybody. It was hard to convince that we, we, we took these documents ultimately when we had them to the Department of, of Justice and to the Federal Trade Commission. And, and essentially, they didn't want to hear anything. They, they, they laughed us out of the room, essentially. Yeah. Uh, so it just goes to show you how times have changed. Today, I don't think we'd have nearly as much trouble uh, getting somebody to believe that an organization could be corrupt. Yeah. What uh, What role did the AMA's hubris, you know, their kind of feelings of of invulnerability, have in all this? Was that Was that at play? Oh, absolutely. They, I mean, they they never imagined. Um, first of all, they never imagined losing. They never imagined the chiropractors would have the wherewithal, the money the determination, the dedication, and and the drive, plus the attorney, uh, to take this case anywhere. So obviously we're dealing up against with a, a multi-million dollar organization, and chiropractors were funding this out of their own pockets, as we have done most everywhere. So the, to the AMA, we were a gnat, I mean literally. Hmm. Um, but what ultimately showed was in law, I mean law is a great leveler, and when the evidence was finally produced that this activity was, in fact, illegal, um, then the, the tide changed. And, and, and I think that that was the first hope. 
Now, while the lawsuit didn't solve all of our problems, what it did was put the AMA and every other organization that was going to do the very similar things on notice that, first of all, we now have a track record, a precedent-setting case that if, in fact, they did things that were not appropriate, they were going to get uh, essentially litigated. And right after Wilk, incidentally, came a very, very similar case in which um, the, the, a hospital system near near Illinois um, prevented a chiropractor and a, and a neurosurgeon from affiliating with each other. And that case was was settled for undisclosed dollars, but there's a lot of zeros at the end of that mm. case. They virtually mm. ruined the neurosurgeon, completely ruined the neurosurgeon. Mm. Um, the guy had a sterling record one day, and the next day he was uh, incompetent. Um, thanks to the AMA's influence. And they found out that that wasn't going to happen anymore. Hmm. Now, I remember uh, being in practice, and I remember the ads that the AMA had to put out, um, and, and I remember the excitement around that. Um, but uh, if you could talk about the long arc of the Wilkes trial and when it began and how long uh, this took. This is not a six-month process. No, no, unfortunately, it was 15 years. And, and George McAndrews, uh, who was turned 80, uh, I think, today. Um, I, he um, uh, calls it his midlife crisis. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, think about this, a, 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 a litigation that took over 15 years to resolve. Right? Um, <clears throat> what happened in the interim, however, was, <clears throat> and I always make this distinction, and I think it's critical that the profession makes the distinction as well. <clears throat> There is a huge difference between clinical medicine and political medicine, and we must make sure that we don't, we don't accuse one of being the same as the other. Uh, clinical medicine, uh, these guys are, care as much for their patients as we do. Um, they basically, uh, when they found out what their political organization was doing, many of them actually bent over backwards to, to comply with and to take referrals and to, they had no idea what was going on in, in, the, in the trenches. I mean, everybody's busy treating patients. They're, they're not worrying about chiropractic. They're not worrying about what their trade association is doing. Many of them were mortified, humiliated, when they found out what, what political medicine was doing. And that's why, incidentally, the membership in the AMA you know, plummeted and so forth because it's not. But here again, the AMA operates on a very different mechanism. They don't care whether they have one member because their economics doesn't come from their membership as, as trade associations and chiropractic do. Their economics comes from multi-millions of dollars from drug ads. So when you think about the, the, the now unholy alliance of Big Pharma and the AMA, you can basically see why. And there was a, early on, incidentally, there was a, an unholy alliance between uh, the tobacco companies and the AMA. Yeah. I mean – so uh, they they will get in bed with just about anybody for money. Yeah. And so the so the tide changes and 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 the 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 objectives change I think over time. Yeah. Well, it's an incredible story. We could talk about it for hours. Oh. And there should be a movie. And I'm I'm assuming there will at, at some point. Well, there the there is a small documentary uh, t touching on some of this. Not enough. But I will tell you that next year, uh, 2016, will be uh, released. Um, either 16 or early part of 17, will be released the history of the AMA litigation. Mm. Uh, NCMIC has funded a, a history of the, it's taken five years to put together, and uh, I'm, I'm anxious to, to read it and see it, and uh, it's been captured. Um, it started uh, originally with Joe Keating and his unfortunate uh, demise. Uh, the, the new authors are uh, Claire Johnson and Bart Green, who are both uh, incredible historians, they are, and they, are. they will do uh, a, an exemplary job of, of putting together the, the actual chronological history of, of the entire suit because it, it's something that we needed to preserve, and, and uh, NCMIC decided that that's worth preserving. Well, that's fabulous. It's, it's, it's something we always need to remember, yeah. and it sounds like ancient history, but I remember <laughs> being in practice going to a local radiologist asking him if he would take x-rays for me, and he said, uh, to your point about clinical practitioners, he said, Brian, I would love to, and if I do, I'll lose my license, because that was before yep. the Wilkes case. And that doesn't feel like me to ancient history. Yeah. That happened to me. Yeah. So.
Uh, well, let's move to the present. Where do you see the uh, the profession today? How are we positioned? Um, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, let me let me let me. Uh, that's an interesting question. Let me phrase it. Uh, by, let me answer it by uh, breaking it up into just two parts. As we sit here today and talk, we're, we're probably in the most um, uh, treacherous position of all. And the reason I say that is because we are in a transition period between health care dramatically and radically changing from a fee-for-service health care system to a bundled fee health care system. But as long as fee-for-service is still in existence, nothing is going to change. So we're in a waiting period, kind of like waiting for the baby to be born. Once the baby's born, then we're going to be able to enjoy the benefits of the baby, and the baby being um, uh, essentially a paradigm shift in thinking relative to health care and health care costs. The future for the profession of chiropractic, uh, in, in my view, is absolutely spectacular. Why? If we, if we just look at the landscape, that 20% of this enormous health care budget is, with, is dealing with musculoskeletal problems. Um, and that's not even including the disability and long time lost productivity. Just the cost of musculoskeletal, which now is absolutely upside down. The, and I'll make this comment, too, that the Wilk suit benefit, and that is today the health care system is not being uh, run or regulated by MDs, it's being run by MDAs who care about the bottom line. I continue to say that, that in the final analysis, all practitioners will be degreed agnostic. Uh, whichever one can do the job yeah. best, with the best outcomes and at the best cost, with the best patient satisfaction, will win the day. And who is better positioned for the 20% of that enormous chunk of healthcare dollars than doctors of chiropractic. So I believe we're going to be sought after. Uh, you can see evidence every day of chiropractors being invited to participate in hospitals as employees, uh, being in, in, in integrated care, and the word integration is the, is the key word, the buzzword of tomorrow. It is, it's such an exciting time to be part of this profession. The changes, they're, you, know, you live in the middle of them, they're, they're literally dizzying that we have VA residencies now that, uh, that the Joint Commission is actually recommending um, chiropractic to yep. be part of their procedures. I mean, that is well, unfathomable. It, yes, it, it, it is unfathomable. And yet, um, when, we, when we look at this, and, and incidentally, I mean, it, let's face it, uh, 50 years is a very short time from the AMA's 1963 Committee on Quackery to 2015. I mean, it's a short period of time. It's a blink of an eye in history. And yet, when you look back and just stop for a moment and look back at the trajectory of where chiropractic was and where it is today, I mean, when you look back just at, just at our educational institutions, they were, you know, they were bricks and mortar buildings that were less than impressive. You can't go to a chiropractic college anywhere in the country today and not be impressed just with the bricks and mortar, just with the facilities itself. And there's not a chiropractic college today that we couldn't put on the on the cover of of some magazine as a stellar as a stellar institution. So if you look at just that, uh, and then you look at where we started off with, you know, kind of our our sole um, researcher, our our token guy, Scott Haldeman, <laughs> um, <laughs> back in the '70s, yeah. and then today we've got literally hundreds of DC with additional degrees um, who are now involved in epidemiology, in, in economics, in, in uh, MBAs, and that's where we are today. We're, we're at a, a place where the profession has evolved to where it needed to be to become relevant. Now, and Gallup, incidentally, that was just released, I think demonstrates that to a large degree, that the what we ha still have to work on is public trust mm -hmm. and confidence. We have to work on professionalism. We have to work on our continuing cultural authority. And we have to work on integration. 
we, we have to get rid of, if we will, the fact that we are the team as opposed to being part of a team. And once we can make that little mental switch that, that everybody has a place in the healthcare delivery and we're part of that team and we're the best at what we do, but somebody else is better, uh, best at what they do, when we finally come to that realization that we can't do it all, uh, the integration piece will click and so will the inclusion of chiropractic services. Uh, you mentioned we're at a treacherous time. And you said we're in a waiting period, waiting for the baby to be born. And you're, you've spent decades in managing risk. So at the profession level, what are, what you said it's treacherous. What are the risks? How can we misstep? Well, I think one of the missteps, as, as, I, as I look at the landscape and, 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 and educational um, institutions are part of that, uh, of that landscape, um, <clears throat> I don't know how fast all of the educational institutions are preparing um, the, the graduates for working in an, in, a, in, a, in an integrated setting. If we continue to do what we've always done, we're not going to be prepared for where we need to be tomorrow. So I, I know that that's a mate. Look, you can't, you can't switch um, educational pieces overnight, and, I, and I'm fully aware of that. Uh, I, and I, and I, have, I have great confidence, incidentally, as I, look at the, as I look at the leadership of all the chiropractic colleges today, um, we're in a new era. We've got new folks taking over the, the, the um, reins of the institutions. They're, they're cooperative. They're congenial. And, they, and I think that they're looking for a kind of a collegiality of how do we get all of our institutions moving forward. The, the, the tide raises all ships, I think, is a, is a new mindset as opposed to I'm not sharing anything with you uh, because you might have a competitive edge. And so – it's, a, it's going to be a huge, huge um, uh, change for the institutions to prepare our students not for solo practice and not for private practice, but for integrated practice. Yeah. That's going to be a major switch. Um, the second thing is, you know, there's an old saying, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. Well, a lot of our practitioners remember the 80s. Um, I considered the 80s a, a decade of decadence. Um, that was when insurance was flow. We, we can't do that anymore, nor will we. The electronic health records today will, will preclude lots of things from happening that could have happened. Uh, f- fraud will be cut down. It will impact the way we research. For example, randomized controlled trials, while they were the gold standard, um, you're going to see registries tomorrow as a result of electronic health records be the way in which research is done with greater not only greater efficiency, greater cost efficiency, but also greater impact in terms of the relevant information we're going to get from that data. So lots of things are going to change at warp speed, almost like a tsunami coming over us. We have to be prepared for that. And, and I, I think the young practitioners um, certainly could, can be adaptive, no question about it. But I think some of the entrenched kind of thinking is going to have to be um, it's going to have to, in some way, shape, or form, be radically transformed uh, because if the leadership is not transformed, then it takes a lot longer for the rest of the profession to come along. Yeah, yeah. Very exciting times. There's no doubt to be. It's, I've, it's, never been, I've never been more excited about the opportunities that this profession has than I have as I'm looking over the landscape in 2016. Wow, that says a lot. It, it is amazing. Your history. Me given your history. Well, one last thought maybe to leave us with, and that you're going to be speaking with, with, uh, with our students in a little bit. Uh, someone about to graduate or recently graduate embarking on the career, what's, what's advice you would have as they, as they start to take this giant step to offering chiropractic care to their patients? Um, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I don't believe that solo practice is really um, an option much anymore. I think they need to find... Um, uh, practitioners who are um, of an integrated mindset, who are strategically positioning themselves in their community, who are affiliating with um, hospitals, who are affiliating with integrated groups, who are affiliating with orthopedic groups, um, who are positioned to essentially be um, a, a worthwhile um, uh, invitation to come in and join a new healthcare team. I think if I had to say anything to young practitioners is you need to change your mindset from 
I to we. And once that you change that and recognize that you're part of a team, I think your your uh, opportunities for b- becoming associated with in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and as you mentioned early, when you think about the VA, when you think about hospital opportunities today, when you think about all of the things, and even today, um, research, for example, we we there was no opportunities years ago for researchers. Today we have them. Um, and I will say one more thing. We, we are probably at the, uh, have so few health policy chiropractors. If I had to, if I had to select a, 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 a trajectory, uh, health policy would be one of the things I think that's an open field today that's going to be an incredible demand because we need to be, there's, a, there's an old politician by the name of uh, James Carville um, who made a statement which I love. He says, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. (laughs) Well, in order to be at the table, we need to be in the health policy positions to be able to influence health policy. And so that's why I think that's such an important piece of where we need to be. But a young practitioner today has more opportunity than ever, and they need to make sure that they adapt themselves. The world isn't going to adapt to them. They have to adapt to the world. Wow. So there's a challenge to some of our graduates who may want to uh, commit to a life of service in a different way to go on and and get postgraduate training in public service or public administration and be at the table in Washington or at state capitol. Absolutely. That's a good challenge. Dr. Sportelli, it's been wonderful to talk about history. It's great to hear about how you feel about the future of the profession, and the future is about teamwork. Yes, it is. Well, wonderful. Thanks for being with us. For more podcasts, go to parkertalk.com.